Alex, can we give him a very warm welcome? Okay, everyone, thanks for coming. Good afternoon. Um, today we're going to be talking about how we've built automated fact-checking tools at Full Fact. Um, let's get into it. So, raise your hand if you're paying more for your food or gas bills rec recently. <laughs> so, as I'm sure you're all aware, we're currently going through a cost of living crisis. The prices of things like food and gas are rising faster than the average household income. And because of this, the, the economy is on everyone's lips and it's become a topic of political discussion. Like any political, dis political topic, we are currently seeing misinformation spread around it. Um, here are a couple of examples. So the first one, Boris Johnson actually um, said that there are more people in work now than prior to the pandemic. This was in fact false. There are 600,000 people fewer in employment now. And then on the other hand, we have Keir Starmer, who claimed that the economy isn't growing when in fact it's, it had been growing on a monthly, quarterly and annual basis. So what we are seeing here is two instances of misinformation. It's important that we cut out su such instances because economic stats and figures are used to form the basis for economic policy and quotes from MPs and those in power are used to inform voting decisions. So it's important that we stamp out claims like these um, if you want to have a functioning democracy. The good news is there is a solution to misinformation. According to a study coming out of a co collaboration between the George Washington University and Ohio State University, fact-checking has been proven to be reduce belief in misinformation. And this was true across countries, cultures, and political environments. At Full Facts, we've been using fact-checking to combat misinformation since 2010. We constantly monitor the, monitor the UK media, identify claims that might be misinformative, fact-check those claims, and then um, in, those fact, in a fact check, we'll pr provide the evidences as to um, why we came to, to the conclusion that we did. We don't stop there. Once we publish a fact check and we've identified a claim as being misinformative, then we'll look for any repetitions of that claim and um, look to set the record straight. So if a, if a misinformative claim um, occurs in a newspaper article, for example, will work to um, get them to retract it or change the statement. In addition to that, we're also involved in policy making. We've recently been involved in the online safety bill, um, fighting to make bad information rarer and less harmful. So a fact check takes um, a considerable amount of time to produce. First, we have to find the misinformative claim and then researching the evidences behind it can be um, a time-consuming process. In the era of social media um, in this new internet age, misinformation, misinformation is spreading faster and is reaching more people. So we want to leverage technology to help us speed up fact-checking to, to meet the demands of the social media age. At Full Facts, we've been um, building automated fact-checking tools to do just that. Um, so since 2016, when we created our automated fact-checking team, we've been working on a number of projects. First of all, we've been working on a claim detection tool that's able to identify um, claims that might be misinformative. We've also been working on a claim matching tool that is able to identify claims that we've already fact-checked. So, um, claims that we've identified as misinformative that might be repeated in the UK media. We want to stop that misinformation spreading, so we use this claim matching tool to um, highlight all the instances where um, um, a misinformative claim might be um, hiding, let's say. And then finally, we've been working on a automated stat checking tool that's capable of fact-checking economic claims 
without human in input. And it's this tool that I'm going to be focusing on today. So here's what our search checker can do. It's able to read a claim like this one from the Daily Express, identify the key information, um, for example, that inflation is the topic of this claim, 5.4% is the value being related to inflation, and we're concerned about the inflation figure in December. It's then able to um, comp compare the information that is gathered from this, this claim against a data set from the Office for, from for National Statistics, who are an independent body who produce the employment, inflation, and GDP figures in, in, in Britain. And in this case, it determined that this claim was in fact true. It was able to verify it. Here's another example. Again, inflation is the topic. 3.1% is the value being related to it. And we're looking at the inflation rate in September. Our search checker looks at the data set, the, re the requisite data set in um, the ONS database and is able to verify it. There are a number of ways we could, approached, could have approached creating our stat checker. We could have gone for a pure machine learning approach, leveraging deep learning and um, large language models, forming the sort of problem as a natural language question answer problem where a deep learning model is shown a claim. It's also shown a sort of corpus of um, data that might be relevant to the claim. And its task is to determine if the claim is true by looking at the data provided. The problem with these approaches is that deep learning models are often quite opaque. And at full fact, it's important that we provide evidence, evidences as to why we reach the conclusions that we do. On the other hand, we could have gone for a more traditional approach, leveraging things like regular expressions and a, and a, and a rule set. The problem with this approach is that, uh, number one, natural language is, is very expressive and it's hard to encode that in rules. Um, number two, um, stat checking requires some sort of semantic interpretation. And again, it's hard to encode that in a, in a rule set, whereas deep learning uh, models that have been trained on large corpuses have some sort of contextual knowledge of, of language. And you could say some, albeit limited, um, real world um, knowledge because of that. Um, so we went, we went for a hybrid approach. We're com combining deep learning on the front end to analyze a claim and pull out the key information. We then pass that information over to a rule set to produce an explainable fact check. So. I thought it would be a good idea to take you through the stat checking pipeline so you can see just how we're um, putting this tool together. Um, so the first step is media scraping. We're scraping 100,000 censuses from the UK media a day from, I think, roughly 60 sources, newspaper, um, newspaper, newspaper articles, social medias, um, and parliamentary transcripts. And then we're applying claim our claim detection model that is able to assign a label to a sentence um, detailing whether the sentence is a claim. If it is a claim, it's able to categorize it as one of eight claim categories, two of which are shown here. Um, so we have a quantity claim label that is assigned to any sentence that mentions a macroeconomic, sorry, that mentions a, a number or numerical measurement. And then we have a prediction um, label that is applied to any claim about, about the future. So for the purpose of stat checking, we want to filter out any predictions claims. We can't um, fact check those. And it's the quantity claims that we're most interested in, specifically those that mention um, a macroeconomic figure, um, such as unemployment or inflation, for example. Um, and we want to filter out everything else. So at the end of this stage, we've pulled in 100,000 sentences. We've filtered out the sentences that we don't want, leaving, it, leaving the macroeconomic claims um, that we can stat check behind. Once we've done that, the next step is to analyze the claims. We need to pull out the key information before we can 
feed it to our downstream rule set that is going to produce our fat check. Raise your hand if you've used one of these tools, Amazon Alexa, Apple Siri, or Google Home. Okay, so what these tools have in common is that they're able to um, listen to an utterance from a user, determine the intent, what the user wants, pick out the keywords and phrases from that sentence or utterance, and then um, perform query resolution, i.e. Do, do what the user wants. And we're using similar technology to create our stat checker. So if I said, hey Alexa, can you book me a flight? I want to go to Geneva, to, I want to go from Geneva to Montreal. It would be able to identify that the intent is a flight booking and that the key information is Geneva and Montreal. The technical name for what is going on here is intent detection and slot filling. And it's a machine learning task that is used heavily in chatbots. And, and this is what we're using to build our stat checker. So there are two parts to this. Intent, intent detection, firstly, determine the intent of a sentence. In the previous example, it was a flight booking. For our stat checking purposes, we've identified a few different um, intents, three of which are shown here. So first of all, we have a, a trend intent. This is a, an intent that is supplied to any sentence that is making a claim about the right rate of change of a macroeconomic um, value. Then we have an exact intent, which is a claim about a macroeconomic value being an exact figure at an exact point in time. And then we have self-comparison intents, where a macroeconomic figure is being compared to itself, a previous, a previous um, state um, of itself. The next step in the next part of intent detection and slot filling is slot filling, assigning labels to the keywords and phrases. We've identified um, a number of useful slots. First of all, we might have a topic slot um, that is applied to the topic of the, of the claim. We might have a date slot that is used to determine what data set um, and the date we need to, to query, basically. What, what, what date is being spoken about. And um, slot filling is essentially putting out the key information that is useful to stat checking. Staying with intent detection and sort of filling for the moment, um, this is something of a, of a pro tip. So when creating a, an intent detection and slot filling model, um, when you create your data set, obviously you want to annotate each, each sentence or each, each claim, and each, each sentence will have a number of labels associated with it. And this can make for a time-consuming um, labeling process. We've leveraged weekly, uh, weak supervision to create a data set automatically without human input that is able to, um, that we've then trained uh, our language model on before fine tuning on manual annotations. And this has really um, been a winner for us. This has allowed us to create a, a successful model much faster. So we created this, this sort of weak supervision process in two steps. First of all, we have a set of logical rules um, that we use to apply to label um, slots, for example, trend slots. A trend slot is assigned to any word or phrase that is, um, is sort of referencing a right rate of change in a macroeconomic figure. So that might be inflation is falling, inflation has fallen. Um, we want to label fallen with, a, with a, a trend slot. So we have a, a bunch of rules that do things like that. And then we're leveraging open source language models. Um, so we're using spacey entity recognition, recognition and the entities that it provides to automatically label some of our slots. Um, so we have a lot, there, there are a lot of overlap between the slots that we want to label and the entities that an intent, um, entity recognition model is able to label such as location and numbers, for example, these are all um, relevant to our slot labeling process. And then using this, we're able to create um, an impactful data set so much faster. 
Okay, so going back to the pipeline, um, at this point we've pulled in media, we've filled out the sentences we don't want, and then we've analysed the claims using intent detection and slot filling, putting out the key information from each one. The next step is to reduce complexity of the um, claims that are left over um, before passing them on to downstream um, tasks. So, as I'm sure you're aware, when you're creating a stats checking model, it's extremely important that it's reliable. You want to have 100% um, faith, ideally, that the stats checks it produces are, in fact, true. We've identified a subset of sentences that our stats checker seems to struggle with, and they tend to be sentences that are um, of a more complex nature. Our stat checker is able to successfully and reliable, reliably um, stat check sentences of low to medium complexity. So our challenge here is to remove those complex sentences. Um, we're doing that in a couple of ways. First of all, we're leveraging a library called TextStat. Um, TextStat has a number of useful sentence complexity measures, um, and we filter out any sentence that is above a certain threshold. We've also identified verb phrases as a proxy for sentence complexity. Um, any sentence that has too many verb phrases, i.e. Do doing phrases like inflation is falling, um, again, gets filtered out. And then finally, we're using a, sent a, a, a simple sentence length measure. Um, we filter out sentences that are too long. At this point, um, we have a batch of claims that lend themselves to stat, check, stat checking, or uh, should I say accurate stat checking, and we are ready to go to our next st step, which is slot cleanup. So, although our um, intent detection and slot filling model is highly accurate, of course it's going to make mistakes. And these mistakes can be um, very detrimental to accurate um, stat checking. So we have a simple slot validation process where we compare things like um, numbers to a set of um, real numbers to make sure that um, they make sense, for example. Um, we ensure that any, any slot that has been assigned makes sense and is, is validated, essentially. And then we also apply standardization. Our, our, the rules on the sort of back end that we're using to produce explainable fact checks are expecting um, this our slots to be in a certain format. For example, dates need to be date time objects. So we do some standardization um, here before passing on to claim resolution, which is the part where we make the actual stat check, um, and, and that's what's next. So, the first part of claim resolution is applying business logic. At this point, we need to convert linguistic features like inflation being labeled as a topic to business features where we know exactly which data set we need to query to get, the, the, um, our, get our truth value, essentially. Um, so we've got a number of sort of rules that we use to convert things like inflation to CPI inflation, which is a specific me measure of inflation that we use. At this point, we're able to identify the, the data set that we want to query. The next step is putting out the, the data from the claim that we want to co compare to our, our uh, um, truth value. Um, so sometimes that's a simple case of pulling out the one number in a, in, a, in a claim. Sometimes it might be the case that there are two numbers and we have to um, resolve slot duplication. And the way we do this is by leveraging um, dependency parsing, which is the task of breaking down a sentence into its um, grammatical structure. And we're using a simple path length measure, which is essentially the number of hops between um, our topic, which is inflation, and um, the numbers which are shown here, 7% and 4%. To, to a human, we can clearly see that the, the value being related to inflation is, is of course, 7%. Um, and then our path length measure 
is something that our stat checker can use to come to the same conclusion. So it will just look at the sentence, take the number that is, has the shortest path, and um, that is usually good enough to make an accurate um, stat check. So wrapping up the pipeline, we've pulled in um, a bunch of UK media. We've thought out the sentences that aren't claims, and we've thought out the claims that aren't macroeconomic claims. We've then analyzed those claims that are left over using intent detection and slot filling before reducing the complexity of the bunch, um, of the set, sorry, um, removing any claim that is too complex. Then we've performed some slot, cle slot cleaning. We've validated all the slots and standardized them before passing those slots onto our claim resolution process where we've um, come up with an accurate stat check. As you can see, we've gone through um, some lengths to make sure that our stat checker is accurate as possible, but of course, it isn't perfect. Here are a couple of examples of ways our stat checks can go wrong. Um, so in the first example, it wrongly identified inflation as a topic and queried an inflation data set, where in fact, in interest rates was the topic of this of this claim. In the second example, it's queried um, UK inflation figures when this claim was in fact about Aus Australian figures, Anthony Albanese being the Prime Minister of Australia. So there are still some things we need to work out, some, pick, some kinks we need to um, improve on. Um, that being said, we have been able to identify misinformation with our stat checker. These are two examples taken from uh, the Daily Mail and the Scottish Herald, um, and just two examples of where we were able to um, produce an accurate, accurate stat check and identify misinformation, which we can then uh, work to clean up and, and set the record straight. Um, and with this tool, we aim to clean up economic discourse and put pressure on those in power to, create, to quote the correct statistics um, and hopefully um, improve our sort of democratic discourse in the process. So in conclusion, I've taken you through our stat checker. Um, hope you understand how important it is and how useful it is. Um, we've gone through how we go from a claim in the UK media to a fully automated stat check and how we, where we plan on leveraging it to put pressure on those in power to tell the truth, essentially. Um, thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, so as of yet, we're not we're not open sourcing, but that isn't a. Um, we may do that in the future. I didn't attend that talk, so I don't know um, the context in which. Well, um, increasing reliability of Wikipedia. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so short answer, no, but that might change in the future. Yeah. We can manipulate the information spread across the, all the social media by the fake information. You collect a lot of sources and it all gives you all fake information. Do you do a, I mean, how do you authenticate against the valid sources of the information versus the information you collect from the social media? Okay, so um, how do we validate valid sources from invalid sources, essentially? So for our stat checker, this is our stat checker currently has quite a narrow scope. We're only stat checking macroeconomic claims, and our sort of true value comes from the Office for National Statistics, or ONS for short, which means um, essentially we, we have one um, source of truth, and that sort of cl clears up any issues. We're not um, turning towards any other um, information sources to form the basis of our stat checks.
Is that also your question? Okay. So there's a very limited information you can fact check. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So you mentioned about transcripts and speech. I guess sometimes it gets quite complicated, like sentences. You don't have just like short sentences. You don't have quite long, complicated sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think um, it, it depends on the claim, basically. Like you said, um, we're forced to ring out any sentence that is, is too long. Um, the, s the threshold is quite high, I think. Um, most sentences that um, have, have been transcribed, for example, I think would, would make it through our system and we'd, we'd be able to stat check them. But um, to answer your question, some, some claims are very complex and um, our set checker does does f does fail, um, and without sort of talking about a specific claim, it's hard to give a better well, better answer. Than that. Trust, it goes off. Like it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like mm. he's the guy, he's the yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think in in future work, what we we do is basically split up his um, if if he's if he's talking for. <laughs> For ages, it's a, it's a really sort of long sentence. We could split it out, split it up into more manageable chunks. I think. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, so um, um, so the question is, how can we be sure that um, bad actors won't leverage um, using long, complex sentences that we can't stat check um, to basically get away with spreading, spreading misinformation? And um, so that, that's definitely a, a consideration um, and something we're, we're going to have to work on because, like, like you said, that is... that. That is a way at the moment, the way we're approaching out um, sentences based on sentence length and complexity, that um, misinformation is going to creep through there. Um, we've taken the approach of getting a smaller set of sentences right before expanding, expanding the tool. But yeah, that's definitely a consideration. Yeah. 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 So, um, so we we do. Okay. So the question is, can the stat checker deal with um, approximate statements? Something like inflation is approximately five percent, for example. Um, so we do have an error rate baked in. So if someone says it's five percent, actually it's five point one percent, we'll give you a pass and say, yeah, that's that's. We're not going to label that as misinformation. Um, but apart from that, as um, dealing with like more ambiguous language, that is something that is is difficult. We've gone f for quite a rule-based approach, which means that would it would be a case of expanding our rule set to sort of include those more ambiguous terms. Um, yeah. Oh. oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, so currently, I think there's only one um, external organisa organisation that's using our stat checker. I think it's the um, not the Office for National Statistics. Um, I, fi I forget the name, but it's like a some sort of um, body, government body that is re responsible for monitoring the use of statistics in the, in the country. 
Um, so so they, they're using it to do just that, basically. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, go on. So, as in, you use the techniques or use our 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 yeah. mod. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. No, not not at the moment, but that's that's in the pipeline there. Yeah. So yeah, I'll I'll keep you posted. Sorry, yeah, bro. I think, yeah, I think, I think, I think it depends. So the question, the question is, and um, once you've identified a case of misinformation, like um, the examples I, I I showed, what do we do? What do we do next? Um, so sometimes um, we might identify cases where the impact isn't isn't that great. For example, they might have they might have got they might have misquoted a figure, but um, as a that ten people read the news article. So in that case, we probably we probably leave it. It wouldn't be worth our our fact checkers' time. But if it was more in impactful, like let's say if Boris Johnson or Keir Starmer um, were the ones peddling the claim, then yeah, we'd work to set the record straight um, and um, publish publish a fact check um, on that. Yeah, so um so so we publish all our fact checks to um our um our website fullfact.org and we also publish links to the, those fact checks um via our Twitter pages. Um we are working on building more of a social media presence. Um in a case where we want to um set the record straight, we'll reach out to a newspaper article like maybe the editor directly. Um um yeah, I guess yeah, I guess that's what I have to say. Yeah, so that's actually in the pipeline and I think that will be of so something similar. Um so soon we'll be rele releasing an API where you can you can check um I wouldn't say how truthful a politician has been, but you can you can see how many times they've said an incorrect statement, a misinformative statement, and then you can also s see if they've set the record straight su subsequently, or if if they just let let it, um, let it lie, basically. What do you mean? Influence. So, as in, so once, once, so if a politician has said something misinformative, and then we and then we publish a fact check, how do we know if we've influenced the party? Is that is that the yeah. question? It's a, it's a fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not a fact. Yeah. So, who says it's it's a fact? The politician says. Yeah. X Y Z. Yeah. The full fact says yes. That's a fact. Yeah. But it's actually in reality, it's not a fact. Um. So. So that's that's a bit of a difficult one. So what I can say is, for each of our fact check, um, so basically you're asking, what happens if we get the fact check wrong? Basically, is that is that your question? Yeah. So the moment you say I'm giving a ranking about, let's say, any company or any politician, there is a chance that you would be influencing the the message you are passing onto the media. It's literally, that's how the U.S. elections and the other elections play out. It plays with the people's sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, the more the sentiment related to that leader in the in the media, people go and vote for that politician. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, that's a bit of a difficult one. Um, what I can say at at Full Fat, we we 
um, there's a phrase that we use in, in, in full facts. Is it's 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 um, based on a football term, but it's play the play the play the claim, not the politician or not the person that's that's saying it. Um, so we we fact check claims and focus on the claims themselves rather than rather than focusing on who's who's making those claims. Um, and then we evidence each of our fact checks so you can a reader can see how we got to that conclusion. In terms of impact, it's a difficult one because we do want to have some sort of impact. We do want to clean up um, um, discourse in the in the in the country um, and, and create a better functioning democracy, basically. Um, but we also have to be careful to to um, sort of tread tread carefully. Um, I think our fact checkers could probably answer that question a bit better. How, so, what, can you repeat the, the last bit, sorry? Yeah, okay, so um, what is this, the process that we use to verify our fact checks and how do we maintain political impartiality? Um, so, um, firstly, um, each of our fact checks are first um, sort of researched by an individual fact checker and then they're they use their fact-checking team to sort of chime in and verify the facts around it. Um, in terms of impartiality, we um, we sort of approach that in a couple of ways. Number one, Full Fact is a charity and is funded by sort of public donations, and we um, make sure that we receive funding from a diverse set of funders um, to sort of alleviate any. Um, potential misconceptions around who's who's funding us, um, and then within the office we maintain political neutrality. Full fact members aren't allowed to discuss politics within the office, and even on social media we can't dis discuss um, um, politics as as policy. Um, so creating a political neut politically neutral environment is how we um, deal with that. Do, so do we anonymize the data um, that our fact checkers see so that their personal biases um, don't come into, in, into their work? Um, short answer, no. It's often the case that our, one of our fact checkers might um, fact check a trending news article, for example. If, some, if Boris Johnson says something, then um, it, needs to, it needs to be fact checked and, and it's not worth anonymizing it because it's on on the front page of every newspaper, for example. So it's not, it's not a step we're taking there. How often is the baseline data um, for the fact checker updated? How often is it uh, looked after or cleaned? Or well, what, when you say baseline data... Like, for example, the Prime Minister keeps changing. Mm -hmm. How often do we change that? That's the fact that needs to be looked after. Um, like I'm, I'm assuming it's referring to some data source. Yeah. Okay, so for the stat checker, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So, so first of all, the stat checker is is has a quite a very narrow focus right now. It's only focused on macroeconomic claims, um, and we're using ex external data sets provided by the Office for National Statistics, um, who maintain those. Um, so we don't have any control control of those. We just access them via API. Cool. I think I think we've run out of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>